So let's just have a look. Um, over the next two terms, Michaelmas and Hillary, I'm going to be teaching a course, first of all, called From Rome to the Romanesque, and then on the Romanesque itself. And it's a wonderful story. And I begin with exactly the same point as I made to you last year. When you first go into a building, the very first thing you should say to yourself is, what holds this building up? Why is it standing? And you'll find that the principles of construction are quite different from one age to another. But for centuries, of course, it was Rome that dictated that, the Roman style of architecture. And we'll have a look at that in just a moment. And they, because of their huge empire, they were able to establish the first pan-European style of architecture. The Romans had a very standard form of building, and what you find in Rome, you will find in North Africa, and you'll find it in Britannia, and you'll find it on the German border. But then, of course, as we all know, the great empire collapsed, and in came the, quote, barbarian, end of quote, tribes, who didn't build in stone. They had huge skills. Their skills in wood were great. Their skills in metalworking were even greater. But they didn't build in stone. And it was only very, very gradually that they learned how to build in stone. And usually from going to Rome and looking at the great old buildings. So Benedict Bishop, who built in Northumbria, he made five trips to Rome in the late 7th and early 8th century and therefore built Monk Wearmouth and Jaron. And then came Charlemagne and the whole process of stone building speeded up. And that flowered into the Romanesque, which again became a pan-European style of architecture. So it's a most interesting period. Looking from the 3rd to the 10th century to see what happened to architecture across Europe during those centuries. It's a wonderful story, as I say there, of success and disaster and then slow, slow recovery. So here we have the Roman style of construction. And I think you can hear me if I move away. Can you hear me at the back? Speak. Yes? yes. Good. <laughs> deep foundations, deep foundations, and then a flat platform on which to build, and then two very solid piers of masonry, linked by a round arch. And then on that, a strong horizontal section, which we call an entablature. You think of it like a beam then you've got the right idea. And on top of that, up you go again. Two strong piers of masonry linked by a round arch. And so strong is that form of architecture that you can go up four stories. And here you see it exactly like that. The thing you must get right is you must have a solid above a solid and a void above a void. So strong that in the end, you can have a pretty well solid wall at the top and the building will still stand. And this building has been standing since 80, 81 AD. And I know it's cut away here, but that's not because it fell down. It's because the Romans are the original recyclers. And who's going to dress stone when you've got a useless building at the end of the road which has got it already done for you? So they took it down and put it in their wheelbarrows and wheeled it away to rebuild their houses. Now the means by which the Romans built, you can see from this, this is the tomb of the Hatteri uh, in Rome around the end of the first century AD. It's about 90 AD. And they were a whole family of builders. And so on the tomb, which is a very posh tomb, as you can see, 
This is pretty blingy stuff. Um, there they have a crane. Uh, if you look to the left, you will see the crane. And inside the wheel, there are at least five slaves working to push that wheel round to carry these vast weights to the top of a building with two more slaves at the top, yes? And you can see the pulleys, and of course they had gears. Um, they knew about using gears. So it's very sophisticated, some of the methods that they used. And to begin with, they are quite tentative, the Romans, in the early days. This is second century BC, while Rome is still really on the rise. And you will see that she's following her great guru in cultural matters, which of course is Greece. And this is very like, very much in the style of Greece. But as time goes on, the Romans become much more adventurous. That is a temple, and so is this. But the style is very, very different. This, of course, is the great, path, the great pantheon, and if you go through that portico and through those great doors, you see the great wonder of Roman engineering. This is an unsupported dome of 43.3 metres across, and it has stood for <coughs> nearly 2,000 years. She's not far off her second millennium birthday, the Pantheon. I think she is one of the great buildings of the world and she's made possible because of one of the greatest inventions of Roman engineers which is concrete. Every ring of that coffering is made of a different form of concrete, a different mix, starting with the heaviest at the bottom and moving to the lightest at the top. And at the very top of course is the oculus which in itself is nine metres across and open. Now, great discussions about why it's open. I think it's open so that the, the, move, the building can move. You can get everything in Rome from 40 degrees to snow. And that ceiling is going to move with different temperatures, and that's why I think it's open. But, of course, also it is the eye of the god and it lets in the sun. There's no window in the Pantheon at all. So these great inventions, both of machines and of materials, made a whole new world of building open for the Romans, and they took it across the known world pretty well. And here, I'm just going to talk today about one aspect of their skill, because that's all the time that I've got. This is Timgad. It's a Roman city in North Africa, in Algeria. And it grew, it was a legionary fortress. It was founded by Trajan, Hadrian's predecessor, around 100 AD. It was founded as a legionary fortress for the third Augustan. And it grew to a city of 100,000 people. Now we're in the Algerian desert with no water. And the reason why it could grow and become a great city was because of the Roman skills in water management. And I just want to show you some aspects of those skills. Rome itself had 15 different aqueducts bringing water into the city. Besides the Tiber, 15 different aqueducts, many of them coming across, of course, the Campania, but some underground. This one is the Aqua Virgo, and it is the remaining Roman aqueduct in Rome today. When I was working at the Vatican, I used to walk up a little road called the Via Monte Brianzo onto the embankment. And in the wall at the side was a big brass kitchen tap, and underneath it said Aqua Virgo. And so you could actually turn on the brass tap and you could draw on the waters, which are the purest in Rome, of this ancient Roman aqueduct, still working today because it was underground. The reason why the others didn't survive was because they were on aqueducts, and the barbarians, of course, destroyed them, 
so that Rome would be short of water. So there it is, the great Aqua Virgo, and there are the water engineers today checking the purity of that water, which is done consistently to make sure that the water is good to drink. Rome, of course, in ancient times grew to a million and a quarter, and those are the people we know about. So if you think you add on all the beggars and the homeless that we don't know about, the city was vast, by far the greatest city in the ancient world. And if you go to the Trevi and you throw in your coin before you leave Rome, then you are actually throwing him to the waters of the Aqua Virgo, or the Aqua Vergine, as they would say in Italian. But many of the old Roman aqueducts do still stand. Here is the one in Segovia. It's nearly 100 feet high, and it brought water 17 kilometres from the river Frio. The Romans loved to draw water from springs or very pure water. They were going to carry it 17 kilometres. They wanted to make sure it was decent water. And this actually helped to bring water into Segovia and provide drinking water until well into the 20th century. I think it was only after World War II with the setting up of the EEC and, um, and new water regulations that Segovia had piped water brought in and ceased to use this. It's a remarkable, remarkable monument. And here is one you might know better, which of course is the Pont du Gard. And this again brings water to a great Roman city Nemausus, as it was in the ancient world, Nîmes, as it is now, which brings water, you notice, from a spring, again, at Uzes, and has to wind through the countryside because of the Massif Central, um, 160 feet high, and it has an interesting architectural feature, because if you do look, you will see it's based on the narrowest point of the gorge, and you will notice that the first two registers are indeed a solid above a solid and a void above a void, but look at the top one. The little arches don't keep to the rule, but the, the, the aqueduct will stand with that because that's where the actual channel of water is. And so great is the Roman control of water that, of course, they can even play with it. And so here is the home of the super rich in Pompeii with its green garden in all that heat for the slaves to water every evening and every morning so that the owner can have this wonderful greenery and little fountains playing. It really is the ultimate in ostentatious display. And if you're an emperor, you can have this a whole swimming bath full of it in front of your summer dining room. This is the villa of Hadrian at Tivoli. Many of you will know it. And under the half arch, under the apse, the diners could recline and in front of their couches flowed channels of water to help keep them cool and also to keep the food cool. And then in front, this vast expanse, I mean, it really is a swimming pool, surrounded by statues. And one way of showing the power of an emperor. And we wouldn't leave Britannia out of this. Um, here we have, of course, the goddess Sulis Minerva, the old British goddess of the springs at Bath, who was Sulis and then the Romans attach Minerva to her and she becomes one of those hybrid goddesses of the Roman world, um, holding sway over that huge complex at Bath. And if you haven't been down recently to look at those Roman baths, I really would encourage you to go. I hadn't been for 25 years and I went last year and was really blown away by how much more they have opened up in the little museum. It's really well worth seeing. Now, that control of water, of course, made city life 
possible not just in Algeria but across the empire. So here we have the city of Verulamium, again a legionary fortress, St Albans as we would say now, and over there we have the stage with the columns standing on it, and then around we have the, the foundations of the seating, banked seating, from which the good citizens of Verulamium could watch the various dramatic performances. And again, it's been largely robbed, as you see, but if you go to North Africa, to Sabratha, you will find an almost complete Roman theatre. Um, and there we have, you see the seating banking round, you can see the entrances both for the um, audience and for the, the actors and actresses. One of the great differences between a Roman theatre and a Greek theatre is in the backdrop. Here we're at Tarmina in Sicily, and basically the Greeks had very little backdrop. They had a stage with what they called the orchestra, but they had very little scenery as such. They tended to perform on a flat stage, and so you would have looked across the stage to that quite amazing view. <laughs> the Romans liked backdrop, and you saw it there at Sabratha, and you can see it here, to some extent, ruined. And of course, we go to Chester, and here we see part of the amphitheatre. Again, water makes possible the games, the fun of a city life. Again, it's a legionary fortress. You will always find lots of entertainment where there are troops, because the Romans knew perfectly well if you're going to keep your troops happy, you've got to provide them with entertainment. And in a fresco from Lyon, you can see horse and chariot racing. Uh, somebody's getting a bit tipped up the back here. I expect you can see the chariots going over. And you can actually see they're wearing their colours of blue and green and red and white. Talk about football betting and the football pools. Believe me, the betting on this horse racing and chariot racing in the Roman world could be crippling, could be crippling. And of course, the whole business of gladiators and the fighting. Each gladiator armed in a different way. And the whole fun of gladiatorial fighting was to set two gladiators with different armament up against one another and see if the chap with the lighter armament could beat his opponent through skill. And that brings us back to the granddaddy of all great amphitheatres, which of course is the Colosseum. <coughs> um, that's where all gladiators and all chariot racing hoped to go eventually, was to this huge um, Colosseum in the heart of Rome. And as you walk round Rome today, you are still really stunned by the size and of the achievement of the Romans. This is part of the great Domus Aurea, Nero's golden palace in the heart of Rome. And e these are underground corridors, but you see how even the underground corridors, the size and the decoration that has gone into these, um, to show the wealth and the power of the man who rules the empire. But it's not only the rich who benefit, because the poor do too. Here we've got the local pub. This is just an ordinary street in Ostia Antica. And here you can stop, I don't know whether you read the Falco novels, but if you read Lindsay Davis, you will know that this is just the sort of place that Fa Falco frequents. So at the side you've got benches to sit on, and then there would be a fire under that little arch, and on top would be cooking pies and pastries, and along the side there are great holes in the marble counter for the sinking of the amphora. So you could stop and have a hot pie and a beaker of wine, watered of course the Romans always watered their wine and they th one of the reasons they thought the barbarians were barbarians was because they drank their wine neat how shocking my dear 
and of course water for other purposes too. Here we have the great public latrines at Ostia Antica and you can see it's a very communal affair. But a huge drain with a great gush of water flowing under the seats so that the waste is continually washed away and in front a little channel in which there would be sponges on sticks which was their equivalent of blue paper and the whole thing is washed through perpetually with clean and fresh water and so it gives you some idea you know of the different uses that the Romans put water to. But then the empire changes because by 313 AD we have a very new visitor on the block and that is Christianity. And the Christians do not want to have buildings which are like the old temples. They want different art, indeed they don't like art at all for two centuries. But eventually they do take to art and we find art like this. And this is from the great Lullingston Villa in Kent in Britannia, now in the British Museum. And of course it is the laurel wreath of victory, Christ's victory over death. And then the key row sign, the cross for CH and the R, CHR for the beginning of Christos. And Alpha and Omega and the doves of peace. And this was on the wall of a room in the villa at Lullingston, which seems to have been used as a chapel by the villa owner and his family, and probably servants too. And so this is a very Christian family in 4th century Britannia. And for architecture, we go to Aquileia. If you don't know Aquileia, it is a very beguiling city. If you like Ravenna, you would like Aquileia. And here we have a typical early Christian basilica, adapted from the old Roman legal building, the basilica, with a great central nave, two aisles, and an apse at the end, which had been used for the judge, but now is adapted for the altar. And this became a very standard form. And on the floor here, the most remarkable mosaics. But adjoining this basilica, which is probably 8th, 9th century, there are 4th century halls. The bishop here must have been absolutely on the ball because the minute that Edict of Milan goes through, giving Christians legal status, the bishop here starts building and builds two halls with the most remarkable, very, very early iconography. So early that actually it's very difficult for understand what it means. But from those early halls, now what does this mean? <coughs> We've got a lobster, apparently in a tree, or on a nest, with a squid above it. Now what that has to do with Christian faith, I can't, I mean there's a cross to the left of it if you notice and there's a star with a cross to the right of it. So we are talking about Christian symbols, but a lobster? What can it have meant? And a donkey above, yes, with a basket of eggs. Now again, is this Easter? You know, is it the journey into Jerusalem? Is it eggs for east out who knows and here are two more we have the cockerel and the tortoise and that ha this this occurs several times in those very early fourth century halls now i wonder if it's a bit like the hare and the tortoise you know only it's a cockerel instead of the hare and then above we have I always like to think the, the master of the building site, and he's the only Roman I know, with a kiss curl and a fag hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> but then, of course, Rome fell. By the 5th century, Rome is falling. By 410, the legions have been withdrawn from Britannia, 
and she's open to invasion from the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes. We have the Huns coming in from Asia, the Green Line. We have the Visigoths moving in. We've got Lombards moving down from Scandinavia and moving gradually through Europe. We've got the Visigoths who actually followed the coastline of Europe round until they finally settled in Spain. And gradually the Roman world crumbles, but of course its buildings stand to show the might of the empire that has gone. And those buildings enable a dream of Rome to live on. And that's why people like Charlemagne, four centuries later, are able to say, that's what I want to do. I want to be a Christian emperor and build like that. But the Roman world didn't just fall, it put up a jolly stiff fight. And here we see one of the great forts of the Saxon shore in Britannia, all the way from Norfolk, right the way round to the Isle of Wight, you find the forts of the Saxon shore, where the last Romano British <coughs> try to hold back um, the Anglo-Saxon invasions till the very last minute and put up a pretty brave fight and you find it all over the empire you find it in Aquileia you find the, the citizens abandoned by the legions shoring up their coastline their, their port with stones taken from anywhere just to try and build a barricade against the invading barbarians now barbarians the Romans called them but they had very great skills. And here we have the helmet, reconstruction of the helmet from Sutton Hoo. And we're going to look at some of the Anglo-Saxon treasures, both from Sutton Hoo and places like the Staffordshire Hoard, which of course is still being interpreted literally as we speak. But if you look at the patterning on that helmet, Look at the setting of the garnets over the eyebrows. Look up the animal set just above the nose. And look at the scenes of fighting across the brow and down the ear flaps. This is a wonderful piece of metalworking from the 7th century. An early English, in inverted king, chieftain, who was establishing his rule in East Anglia and his great belt buckle with the intertwining serpents from the middle in pure gold. I'm often asked where did this gold come from? Well of course it's Roman gold melted down. Roman gold coinage had a very high percentage of gold in it. And finally the lid of his purse. The purse itself had rotted but the lid is quite magnificent with gold and set with garnets and I've blown up for you in the little detail just one of those you can see that this yes is one of those yes and it really shows you the detail in which these jewelers because these are jewelers they're not just metal workers but building itself did have to take they, they built in wood but they didn't build in stone. And it's not until the very late 7th and the early 8th century. Um, here we've got a Lombard chapel. This is quite a recent discovery over, since the war, that this, the, the bones of this are Lombard from the 7th, 8th, possibly very early 9th. It's very difficult, but let's say 8th uh, in northern Italy. Um, possibly the statuary on the wall is later and certainly the woodwork is later but we have got there the bones of the recovery of European architecture stone building gradually rebuilding and also of statuary here we've got you will probably see Mary um, with the Christ child on her knee and the three kings making their gifts 
while the angel flies above and poor Joseph, as usual, is relegated to a very back place. But she sits on a very interesting throne which is made of wood and rush but seems to have this extraordinary canopy over it. Um, it's a, and of course a, a long inscription. The Lombards know that proper people have proper ins inscriptions and so you might be able to see the word Armarent above. Yeah. But then things alter a gear because then we do have Charlemagne who sought to rebuild a Roman Empire and although he didn't really succeed he did take the title of Holy Roman Emperor and I always say remember it's neither holy nor Roman nor really an empire but apart from that he's fine here is his Palatine Chapel at Aachen attached to his great palace at Aachen and you will see very much in the style of Rome, very strong, round arches, the dream of Rome lives on. And that was very quickly taken up by those descendants of the Vikings who we call the Normans. They are of course Normans because they were the Northmen who came into um, northern Gaul and established and a pretty tough lot they were. Um, remarkable people, the Normans, one has to say, that old Viking adventurous spirit. At just the time when William the Conqueror is coming to England and taking Anglo-Saxon England from its Anglo-Saxon kings, the Normans are also sailing south through the Straits of Gibraltar and establishing themselves in southern Italy and making themselves eventually kings of the whole of southern Italy and Sicily from just below Rome where the papal lands ended. They are a remarkably adventurous people and they take up that round arch dream of Rome which we call Romanesque. Romanesque because it's in the style of Rome and there it is at Durham here it is at Canterbury, with that chevron dog tooth ornament which is so typical. And you find it at Hereford, you find it at Peterborough, you find it at Ely. Um, when you look at the crypt, the, the Romanesque Norman crypt at Canterbury, there you see really Roman building, those short, round, stubby columns, strong feet, capitals, the revival of the capital, what we call cushion capitals because of their shape, and then the round arches of the vaulting. And just like the Roman style, that Romanesque spread across Europe. Here we have it at Autun in Burgundy with these wonderful French timpani, each with the most remarkable program of art. And here we have it in Spain, at Leon, in the Royal Ma Ma Mausoleum. But look at the similarity between Canterbury, crypt, and the Royal Mausoleum here at Leon. Um, it, it's a rem you can see how pan-European this style has become. And here it is perhaps at its grandest, at Ely. Um, that great nave of Ely is one of the great triumphs of Norman Romanesque style with of course a wooden roof, painted wooden roof as it still is today and it's breathtaking. Now they didn't only paint, they also used a great deal of mosaic and we're going to have a look at mosaics in this Romanesque period because it's an art that has survived from the ancient world. So here we have the remarkable apse of San Clemente in Rome with a cross which is set at the base of the tree of life. And if you look at the foot of the cross you will see the plant growing and the great tendrils growing out with all forms of life contained in those tendrils, the cross as the tree of life. 
and Christ hangs in the middle there, but around him are twelve doves of peace, the disciples going out to spread um, the gospel across the known world. And then, of course, we have Venice. Again, San Marco is a, a Romanesque building. Look at those arches. And it's not only the tesserae of the mosaics themselves, but it's the very way the marble is worked, which has come through from the ancient world. If you look at those piers on the left-hand side, can you see the patterning? Now that is done by cutting a piece of marble into very thin slabs and then using the natural veining of the marble to set it into four sections so that it creates a flower pattern. And you won't see it done anywhere better than in San Marco in Venice. You'll also see it in Byzantium, for those of you who know the Byzantine world. But the way the marble is cut is one of the great m marvels. And I think so often when I see people shuffling through St. Marco, which you only can these days, I want them to stop and look at those walls and marvel at the way that stone is cut. And then in Sicily, the strangest of all, really, because, of course, here we have Byzantine mosaic. We have round arches up there in the squinch on the left, but you notice we have an Arabic pointed arch, which of course is where Europe begins to pick up its pointed arch and to understand that the pointed arch is more efficient than the round arch and carries weight more efficiently through a wall mass than the round arch does. So we'll look at painting, we'll look at mosaic, we have a look at book illumination. And here is one of our greatest um, treasures, the great Winchester Bible, with its patron Henry of Blois. Um, he was a great patron of the arts, not just at Winchester, where he was bishop, but to Cluny in France, to Glastonbury, one of the great abbeys. He was a great patron of art and architecture and books and building and statuary. Royal family, of course, immense wealth, and so he has the power to do it. And if you look at those illustrations in the Winchester Bible really carefully, you are able to see the hand of the different masters who painted. This is actually, as you see, the beginning of the book of Exodus. It's a capital H. And this is by the master of the leaping figures. And he came originally just to underdraw the pages and then becomes the principal artist. And he always has a tangle of limbs. If you look at that top illustration, you'll see how the arms and hands intertwine. And that's he loved this complexity of mixing up, of interlinking his figures. And also, of course, he has this very sinuous drapery, which again you see on those figures. So books, mosaics, painting, and of course stained glass. The Romanesque period takes up stained glass and uses it to very great effect and here we have the windows of the Trinity Chapel in Canterbury one of the appalling events the murder of Becket which caused this outpouring of art and architecture in Canterbury which received a lot of royal patronage but went across the whole of Britain and Northern Europe and then one you may not think of which is embroidery, because England in particular was very, very famous in the Romanesque period, in the 12th century in particular, for its embroidery. Opus Anglicanum, it was called, English work, and so famous that popes used to commission copes and other pieces of church embroidery in England uh, in order to give it to, as presents to different parts of the church. So English embroidery, after all, 
uh, look at the Bayer tapestry. And you do find this embroidery in some amazing places. That wonderful coat, which is in amazing condition, was found in a cupboard in a nunnery in Rome, as you see, and is in extraordinary good condition. Um, th these are stockings, which were owned by Archbishop Hubert Walter, and they are beautifully decorated. I don't know whether you can see on that slide, but can you see the diamond pattern? and the various patterns that they're on. He was buried with all his vestments, including his boots and his stockings, as well as his stoles and his copes and his, um, well, stone, yeah. Um, so an amazing set of Episcopal vestments in the tomb when they opened it. And then finally, perhaps quite beautifully, ivories. Um, this summer I went to Salerno to refresh my mind on the Salerno ivories. They are an astonishing cycle of ivories from the late 11th century. There were ivory schools in both Amalfi and Salerno and these are probably, they're, they're probably done by both schools. There are about 16 pieces left, Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament ones are horizontal and the New Testament ones are vertical. And here you see a very interesting one. I wonder, do you know what this is? It's creation. Yeah. There is God creating through the angels. He's standing there giving his orders to the angels. Get out there and do, he's saying. And there is light, lux and nox, light and day, night and day, and the spirit hovering over the waters, which is exactly what Genesis says. They are about as large as any ivory plaques can be. And then finally we come home again to look at two quite remarkable cycles of sculpture. The Romanesque was so creative. This is a little church in Kent called Barfreston. I don't know whether any of you know it, but if you don't, you should make a little pilgrimage to Barfreston. It's built originally by about 1080, and that lower course of stonework you can see is flint. But then it was remodelled in Caen stone stone specially brought in from Caen in France around 1180 and the sculpture on its doorways is quite remarkable. Um, iconography we can read more easily than we can the mosaics at Aquileia. So here is the south doorway and you can see what is almost certainly Christ in majesty in a mandola, yes, in an almond shape, the shape of glory. And you may be able to see that above him is a bishop. You see the bishop? Here, yeah. Now, no one's quite sure, but almost certainly, this is only a few miles from Canterbury, and so almost certainly that is Beckett. Um, I mean, around 1180s and 90s when this was being remodelled, you know, his fame was all over Europe, this murdered archbishop. And so I think that is Beckett. But all the way around, you can see the different registers around the tympanum. And the detail, considering that this is 1180, is extraordinary. Here you see the right-hand side, the right-hand pier of the south doorway. And you can see that there are two knights jousting. See, here is the one, and his spear, and here is the other. You can see the horse's head, and the two are going to meet on the corner uh, and come to a very nasty bang. And then the little animals above, a bull, a horse, and then around onto the next capital, we've got a griffin and a lion, who again are fighting just like the two knights. You can read all kinds of stories into these, you know, why have two fighting things there? Well, we can discuss the meaning. And then for some things that are just such fun. There is a bear playing a pipe, 
and I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> I call it a monster. He's got a huge tankard, and he's going to be very, very tiddly by the time he gets to the bottom of that. Some people think it's a bell. I don't think it's a bell. I think it's a tankard. I think he's having a quick slurp. <laughs> And here, a remarkable one, we have a man who is sitting between two animals. The one on the left is certainly a hare. You see its long ears? And he's playing a viol, a very early form of cello, if you like. Um, and the other church, of course, which has the most remarkable cycle of statuary, um, is Kilpeck in Herefordshire. And so this great school of statuary in Kent and of statuary in, in, in Canterbury. Um, two remarkable schools from the Romanesque, England in the Romanesque period, which will bring that course to an end. So, just to sum this up, this course is actually two terms, but you can take either individually. You don't have to take both. There's the story of from Rome to the Romanesque, which is uh, the Michaelmas term, and then in the Hillary term in the spring, you can just do the Romanesque with its book illumination and embroidery and statuary and so on. But remember that also we are doing many, many other courses in the art and architecture department. Um, and as I say there, tutors absolutely panting to teach you. <laughs> Um, so do have a look at the brochure and see what else we are offering and just before you go remember that the weekly courses are only one aspect of our work there are weekend courses residential or not here at Ruley House there are online courses which you can do at home on your own and then when you have done so many of the ordinary weekly classes if you want to you can rise to the splendours of the certificate and when you get through that you can rise to the even greater splendours of the diploma. So lots to do, lots to entertain you and I hope you find something that you would like.